Tonight, I wanted to do a show, um, you know, we're going to do it next week, probably, where we have to talk about events as they are unfolding in our nation. And uh, we are so alarmed that no one seems to be alarmed as we watch America disintegrate before our eyes. No matter what you have to say, it's exactly what's happening. Come on, look around. We really need to pray for our nation because I don't know if we're going to be, can we say, as prestigious as we have been over the last century. The Lord used us admirably so to actually help Israel to return to the promised land. And he blessed us as a result. I mean, we were really blessed when you go back after World War II. I mean, the Jews, Israel reestablished itself, which was very prophetic. And we have been a friend of Israel, a great ally. And God said he'll bless them that bless Israel and curse them that curse Israel. And that's the way things are. But tonight, we'll come back to that discussion because, you know, we're probably going to be canceled when we have that discussion. I hear, um, I'll call him Brother Musk. Okay, I hope he's a brother. He talks like one of us sometimes, you know. Jesse, have you heard him? Um, yeah. Elon talk about Christ? Yeah, I, I actually heard him accept Christ, but I think it was more done in vain than anything else. Amen. But what a, a wonderful idea that he purchased. Twitter. Isn't that extraordinary? And I was so happy when it occurred, and I think all of us were, um, because we've been suspended so many times, you know, almost as though we've done something wrong just by not following the orthodoxy. And, you know, we have been hoodwinked in that we go back 20, 25 years. You could make your pick, ABC, NBC, CBS. They fought for ratings. They gave you the news from different perspectives. And, and they were concerned about truth. You remember those days. Remember those days. Now, it, it seems as though just at the onset of the Trump era, something happened, okay? And it became Russia. It's not just Russia now, it's been Russia. Okay, I mean, Russia helped him get election. Russia is he's Putin's puppet. We heard all of that stuff, okay? The facts weren't so, but we heard it all. Hmm? We heard about interference in the election from Russia. Now, we commissioned a study. We had, we, they hired one of the best, Durham. They thought, okay, he's very impartial. He came back and said it was the Hillary Clinton campaign that did it. But guess what? It didn't happen if you didn't hear about it. It just didn't happen and most people didn't even hear about it. So after watching Russia, 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 Russia for the whole Trump administration, the man did a lot of admirable things. Um, don't get me started. I, I'll give you some prophetic things that he did. He moved the ball along for the nation of Israel. He did a magnificent work, and they respect him for it. And God had blessed us as a result. We'll come back to that next week, possibly. 
but I know when we have this discussion, we're going to get canceled again. So, you know, I mean, we have to talk about stuff that no one else seems to be talking about. Okay, so, you know, stay tuned on next week. We'll, you know, just sit around and talk. And hopefully we won't ruffle too many feathers. But tonight, I, I wanted to do something theologically. You know, the perfect peace hour. And, and we're going to exalt our Savior tonight. But I think I can help you. Okay, there are some gaps that we all have in our understanding of what happened, okay? Um, I went ahead and I did a message not long ago on the longest day, okay? We are talking that resurrection day. And we looked at all of the things that Jesus did on that day, okay? And if you think he just got up from the dead and just started to party with his friends and, and things of that nature, no. That day was so pivotal, okay? Um, Israel needed that day, okay? The Gentiles, us, we needed that day. And he operated on behalf of all of these different groups on that day. And I want to read a passage of scripture. Simon Peter on the day of Pentecost, the birth day of the church, when they were preaching and and people were there speaking various languages and everyone heard them speak in their own language. We call it speaking in tongues, not unknown tongues, other tongues, okay? You won't find unknown with it, except it being italicized, okay? No, it's unknown tongue, just read the text. Now, that day of Pentecost, there, there were people there from, Every nation, I mean, they came to keep the feast, okay? And Peter was preaching, and I, I want to take a little piece of the sermon there. There's so much there to unpack, but bear with us, okay? And we'll take verses 22, okay? Um, and we'll read through 27, and we'll take a look at it. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Peter stands up to preach, and he said, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. One of these days we'll open that up. Mm. You have... Listen to this, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it, death. Woo -wee. For David speaketh concerning him. Please understand that. This is verse 25 of Acts chapter 2. He said, for David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will you allow thine holy one to see corruption. That's Psalm 16, okay? Verse 10, to be specific. I want you to think about that statement, okay? I want you to hear this. Here's what he said. He said this, therefore, in verse 26, did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also, my flesh shall rest in hope. That's an interesting idea. Here's a man speaking after death, speaking about what will occur after death, that his flesh is going to rest in hope. What? I want you to, con no, your flesh is going to decompose. It's going to get buried after you die, whether it's a whatever type of funeral, okay? But no. 
Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. You're not going home with us. Okay, we understand how that is, but he said this. Verse 26 and 27 to give, look together. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou will not leave my soul in hell. What? Neither wilt thou suffer or allow thine holy one to see corruption. Speaking of Jesus. Okay. Let's unpack it. This is a, a wonderful Bible lesson. We are speaking now of, let's take the crucifixion through the resurrection. We're not gonna spend much time on the crucifixion, which we should. We're gonna spend more time on the resurrection day today. All right? now. There are several things that occurred when Jesus was crucified, okay? Um, he had to finish his work after crucifixion, okay? I mean, he was tired that day. He was worn out that day. He was crucified. He was murdered. He was killed on that day. No shortcut. That's what happened on crucifixion day. And it was a painful, painful torturous death, okay, after he had been, uh, you know, inquisitioned and, and flogged, not just flogged, but beaten extremely with a cat of nine tails, you know, we talk about those whips and how they rip your flesh, and then he couldn't even climb the Via Della Rosa with the stripes on his shoulder, so what had to happen, they, they saw a young man that seemed pretty fit, and, you know, they told him, hey, you come, help him carry the cross. Now that young man, we know his name, and we see his sons in the scripture mentioned prominently, Alexander and Rufus in the book of Acts. Okay, so here is what happened. We're talking about Joseph of Arimathea, of course. Here is what happened. Jesus is on the cross, suffering. Now, from the sixth to the ninth hour, picture this, darkness over the face of the whole earth, all right? Now there are some places that were already in darkness because it, it was nighttime, but nevertheless, Jews require a sign. Gentiles seek after wisdom, just the way it is. So God told them to be sign seeking. So that was quite a sign. Well, just think about it for a minute. Okay, that was a bad one. Okay, yeah, there was a sign above his head that ended up there, okay, that says Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and they were hostile about that sign. Okay, in fact, they left him crucified on the cross to run back, okay, to tell Pilate, take that sign down. Please take that sign down. Why would you do that? We don't, that's what we are trying to prevent people thinking he's the King of the Jews and you put a sign over his head written in all three languages where everyone who walks by will see, yes, that was a testimony against the Jews also. He came unto his own. His own received him not. But then guess what? To as many as receive him, to them give he power to become the sons of God. Now, we'll unfold all of that also. But what we're looking at is while Jesus was on the cross, you know, we talked about the two thieves before. Um, I, I told you that, um, you know, history records their names as, as Gismus, Dismus and Gesmus. Go figure. Okay, we don't know which one is which, though. Okay, that's not clear. But th that's the names that has been affixed to the two thieves. We don't really care. They're, they're almost like props in this story, but they're more than that. Okay? If you look at it, what happened on the cross was this. They were cheering at Jesus. If you are the Christ, come down, save yourself. And you know, hey, come down, save yourself. Prove to us that you are who you are. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. That this the, laughter, laughter. Okay, they I mean, that was their greatest day. They were crucifying Jesus. I mean, he had stolen their thunder as it read. These are religious leaders. And the crowds was following Jesus. 
Okay, so you you understand what was happening, legalism, and and I mean they that was their finest hour. So Jesus is on the cross dying, and they're cheering and jeering. Come down, come down, come down, come down. However, they were doing it. Okay, and one of the thieves it was it was so. I mean, it, it, it must have been a really good chant because he stopped dying on the cross to chant the same thing. He said, yeah, if you are the Christ, why don't you come down off the cross and save yourself and us? I'm quoting. Then the other thief looked by Jesus and looked at Dismas and said, what's wrong with you? We are being crucified for our crimes, okay? And they are numerous. This man has done nothing amiss. So you ought to show a little respect. Those are my words. But then he looked at Jesus and he said, Lord, uh-oh, Lord, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Wow. I wonder, that's... All, all he heard that day brought him to that place that he knew Jesus was, was, was a king, but his kingdom is not yet. But he asked him specifically, will you remember me? Lord, please remember me. And Jesus said, today, today you will be with me in paradise. Don't forget, we're working with David's message. David said, you're not going to leave my soul in hell. And in addition to that, neither will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Uh-huh. David saw corruption. All of them saw corruption. That's decomposition. When the Bible mentions corruption, okay, it's not talking about government mishandling resources or, or anything else. It's speaking of decomposition, corruption. So, David said, you won't leave my soul in hell. Is that where his soul was? In hell? And that's what Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. He said, David said in verse 27, because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. The Holy One is Jesus. So it's amazing how we put those two together. You won't leave my soul in hell, neither will he see corruption. All right, let's take a look at what we are talking about. Today you will be with me in paradise. That's what Jesus said to that thief. What a promise, okay? But I, I, don't, I don't know about promises like that. You got to die for that promise to come, come true. You know, today you, uh-oh, you'll be with me in paradise. We're leaving here together, buddy, okay? It's pretty much what Jesus was saying to that guy. But he had faith. He had faith. And because he had faith, that guy, Okay, I'm talking about Gismas or Dismas as the case might be. That man was one of the most blessed men in all history. A thief, a common criminal being crucified for his crimes ended up receiving one of the greatest blessings. Could you imagine walking into paradise with Jesus? Uh, today, you will be with me in paradise. The reason I said walking into paradise with Jesus, they didn't die far apart. Okay, I want you to understand. Jesus got there first, then he followed soon after. How can you say something like that? Well, guess what? They came with the mallet to break their legs because it was getting late. If you break the, 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 the shin bones, okay? If you break the bones, they can't push off the spikes and they will suffocate almost immediately with broken leg. 
So they came and they broke the two thieves' legs. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. So Jesus got there first. And right after the trauma of him having broken legs, he's going to walk into paradise. Okay? He didn't, he didn't wheel his way into paradise from a wheelchair. Okay? Please understand, broken bones and things like that don't matter. In the, in the other life, you'll be perfect. Okay. And when I say perfect, I'm the, you're just going to look just like you, but that'll be perfection because you'll be sinless. Isn't that going to be something? Okay. That's the other life. But I want you to stop and think about what happened in paradise that day. But uh oh, wait a minute. Jesus called it paradise, David calls it hell. Which is it? Is it paradise or is it hell? And that's an important question, because there are a lot of people running around. Um, in fact, I did a funeral, I must have spoken about it before, where um, a lady got up, you know, people get up to make remarks, and she was a relative of the young man and said, well, you know, he may not have accepted Christ in this life. Okay, that's what she said. But when, when... When you go to hell, you know, you can call on the Lord then when you see it's hot. Now, I'm, I'm, I wasn't presiding at the funeral, but the presiding minister hadn't showed up yet. And I wasn't going to let that fly. Okay. So I got up right after she got done. There were more people lined up to talk. I said, you all going to have to wait a minute. Okay. That's what I told them. I said, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Okay. Hell doesn't have a any type of exit. There's no exit sign in hell, okay? If you go there, no, you can't call on Jesus when, that's what she said. She said when, when he gets there and he sees that it's hot, he can call on Jesus right away. The Bible said if you call on Jesus, he'll save your soul. A woman said that. Somebody was churched too, okay? It's kind of like, what? You know, some people let that stuff go for not wanting to embarrass Okay, you're not going to embarrass my Savior. I'll embarrass you first. Amen. Okay? And I, I mean, you know, you're not going to misrepresent Jesus. So this idea that he went to hell, what did he go to hell for? Will you tell me? No, you can't tell me. But I'll tell you what. The place where he went, in some places, is described as the pit. Here is why. There's a story in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 32. It's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus tells the story. It's not a parable. It's a story. Yeah. Okay? Parables, you'll say a certain man and, you know, no specifics, no specificity in a parable. Okay? This one is a story. And Jesus told the story. There was a certain rich man that feared sumptuously every day. He did everything well. He had tons of money. He was just, you know, a rich man that was high on himself. Okay? And he said, there was also a beggar in this story whose name was Lazarus. We don't care what the rich man's name is. Okay? We care what Lazarus' name is because we're going to see Lazarus, but we're not going to see the rich man except at the great white throne. But the rich man, it's not because he was rich, all right? Please, there are a lot of rich people who, who are in Christ and a lot of rich people that are great people, all right? So this man would not even allow this man the crumbs that fell from his table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. That's what the Bible says, just like that, all right? So in the passing of time, Lazarus died okay, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. I'm quoting this story, remember that. It says the rich man also died and was buried. What? Did you hear what I just said? It says Lazarus died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Wow, the angels are involved on that level? You know, shuffling people back and forth and stuff? Yes, they are. Okay? 
So the angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and was buried, and in hell he opened his eyes, being in torment. And he looked over to the other side. Now we are talking. So that place that is called hell now, and the place that is called or was called paradise then, I'm talking about at the time of Jesus, paradise was there. It's no longer there now. Paradise is gone. All right? Jesus emptied that place. You have to understand that's what happened. Okay? They were waiting down there for Jesus. All of the people in paradise go all the way back. pre duvillian before the flood. God gave them a sacrificial system in the Garden of Eden. Okay? Because Adam had blown it, he messed it all up, Adam had sinned, and he brought sin into the human experience, and he's the father of all of us, so all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We inherited that nature, all right? So just picture Adam. From Adam, God gave him a sacrificial system, and that sacrificial system where a man had to sacrifice, we see it play out with his two sons. Cain and Abel. Okay? One man sacrificed unto the Lord, the other one did not. God came to him and said, you know, hey, why is your countenance fallen? You do what your brother is doing, I'll bless you too. Okay? But instead, he killed his brother because he wanted to hurt God. And if you kill the brother, you hurt both of them. Isn't that extraordinary? We're talking about Cain. But nevertheless, that sacrificial system that God gave them was sufficient to get them somewhere. But they couldn't go to heaven because guess what? Their sins were still with them. They did not have forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of sin happened when Jesus came on the scene. Please understand, sin before Jesus were covered. Okay, God covered it. That's the description that he used. Picture taking a blanket and covering all your sin in the center of your living room. Okay? God covered your sin, but it was not forgiven. It was not taken away. So you couldn't come to heaven. You had to go to a holding place, a waiting place. But from what we can see, that place was pretty nice. Because when you look at the rich man and Lazarus, okay, he said the rich man looked over from the other side, being in torments, and saw Lazarus, the same beggar, over there in Abraham's bosom. That's that place, Abraham's bosom. He's the father of faith, Abraham, all right? So, and he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus. Huh? I mean, he was of the servant class back there. I didn't pay him much attention, but nevertheless, send Lazarus. Let him dip his finger in water and come and cool my tongue for I'm being tormented in this flame. Remember what he said. I'm being tormented in this flame. We are talking about a man who lived on earth and died. Had a great life, lots of money, but he didn't have a relationship with our God. What does a man profit if they gain the whole world and lose your soul? I used No, I'm not going to call you any names, but you'd have to be as dumb as a bag of rocks hmm? to miss this, especially when God wants to gift it to you. Everlasting life comes to us as a gift because God loves us so. Do you know it's all about information and you're responding to it? Wow. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to go to Rome. You don't have to go to Mecca. You don't have to go anywhere. You can accept Jesus Christ right where you are. You don't have to join a secret society. You don't have to join this club or that club. You don't even have to join a church, but you will want to. Why? Because we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so we can serve him. You know what? You have power to open the door to heaven for your loved ones or anybody in your life. You have, if you are born again, if you are a Christian, do you know, wow, 
You actually can tell somebody, go to hell. It don't mean they're going. I believe he'll slap you around a little bit because that's not why he left you here to let anybody go to hell. His will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So picture this. Now Abraham said this to him. He said, remember back there when you had all that stuff and he had nothing. Now look at you now. He is being comforted and you are in torment. And beside, there's a great gulf fixed between us where he can't come over to you and you can't come over to us. Well, since you can't come and help me, send them to my father's house because I have brothers and I don't want them to come into this place. Now he wants to be an evangelist from hell. But you're seeing concern. I mean, his life is over and he is saying, I, don't, I wouldn't let my my brothers come in here. No, send, he can't come and free me. Well, uh, you know, send him there. I want you to think about all of this. Now we just, we don't get too engrossed in this story, all right? Because the one place that was paradise is empty now, okay? The other guys needed the space. They did, okay? Because hell is gonna, Big, big place. That's where the, they say that's where the party is. No, you're not going to be able to see anybody. You're going to hear screams. Huh? He was, he, he didn't sound like he was in a, in a, in a nice nightclub or something. Or even in church. I'm talking about the guy on the other side. He said, I'm being tormented in this flame. Just send him so he can dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. My Lord. And he had his full memory. He remembered his brothers. He remembered everything. He remembered the times he rejected. Huh? All of that. Now, that's a true story. Now, let's get back to our story. If you think about that for a minute, Jesus tells this man, today you'll be with me in paradise. Wow. So the instant a Jewish person died, they went straight there. Now, it's not just a Jewish person. God was willing to save anybody who would keep his covenant. So you had to get circumcised in the Old Testament to begin the relationship with the Lord. Then you had to do, he had a Levitical priesthood at, at you know, that certain time and, and you had to come to Jerusalem to worship. So it was Jews and proselytes. It wasn't just Jews. A proselyte is somebody who accepted Judaism as their religion and the Old Testament that was the place to be okay but not now okay now you'll be you they're wealthy generally speaking okay but don't worry about that you know you can't become one of those right now you're not it's not for you okay besides we've got a great thing going with Jesus Amen. because now we are his bride they're the children we're the bride who got more power huh tell me who got more power the children? No. The bride, of course. Okay? We have the power right now. Okay? You have to understand, we as ambassadors, the highest ranking members of his diplomatic delegation from one government to another. Do you realize that's what you are as a Christian? Well, let me tell you what happened down there now. So, going back to the original premise, where... Peter is speaking of David saying, you will not leave my soul in hell. That's for me, David. That's David. Then he said, neither will you allow your Holy One, who is Jesus, to see corruption. He would never decompose. Okay? So, what we're looking at is Jesus going into paradise that day. You know why he had to go to? Because he came under the law. Come on now. So everybody who died had to go to paradise. How do I know Jesus was the last one in? Or, or the thief? Because Jesus promised him, okay? How do I know the thief was the last one in? Because the veil in the temple, that curtain in the temple ripped from the top to the bottom. That's impossible to happen because it's, it's attached at the top. So God ripped it. And you know what that means? 
He is removing the middle wall of partition between him and us. All right. When he did that, when God, okay, ripped the veil in the temple, he is saying, you can't approach me through that Levitical priesthood anymore. You don't have to come to Jerusalem to keep the feast anymore. They're going to come for Pentecost. But after that, oh man, the church took off. You see, and we're talking about the day of Pentecost when Peter preached that sermon. That's the birthday of the church. That's fifth. The word Pentecost means 50. So it was 50 days after Jesus ascended back to heaven. Okay. Boom. The Holy Spirit came. God is not doing a new thing, but he sure is doing it different. Okay. And now the Holy Spirit indwells everyone who accepts Jesus Christ. He couldn't do it in the Old Testament. You know why? Same reason they couldn't go to heaven. Their sins weren't forgiven. So there was no indwelling. In the Old Testament, he came upon man to accomplish his will. When man was disobedient or the task was finished, the Lord, the Holy Spirit left. That's just the way he operated throughout the Old Testament. Now, in the New Testament, when a man accepts Christ, our sins are washed away. Now the Holy Spirit is baptized into us. He takes up residence inside of us. It's called being born again. We, okay. Listen, this is not a joke. There are people masquerading as Christians. Oh, you know, some of them even have enough intellectual assent to tell you, you got to believe, Jesus. Yeah, it's just believe. You'll see evidence. You're bound to see evidence. You tell, you're telling me that Jesus came into your heart and there wasn't a wonderful change? Okay, remember the song? What a wonderful change in my life has been wroth since Jesus came into my heart. Come on now. Don't get me started. You will never be the same to see people get up and walk away and go back to their ordinary nothing. Okay? No, that's not salvation. It's kind of like, wow, he loves me that much that he would do all of that for me? This lesson is not finished. We are talking about resurrection day. Right now, we are talking about crucifixion day, which was Friday. So, Jesus goes to paradise. They've been waiting for him down there, man. All those thousands of years all of the people that died, that was a big place, okay? Everybody who kept the covenant, everybody who, who participated in God's system, all right? Where you had to come to Jerusalem to worship. He was just setting them up so they'd be there when Jesus comes because he loved them, okay? He gave them a bunch of feasts and, and rituals that they had to come to Jerusalem to keep, and that would set them up to see Jesus. But instead, they wanted to stone him rather than follow him. So what you're looking at is this. On that day, let's talk about it. We talk in Resurrection Sunday. Now, the Bible tells us that what he did was this. Hebrews 9, 22 says this. It says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission okay it says it was therefore necessary that the patterns of these okay had to be purified with blood also but also in heaven and heaven itself would better sacrifice it you can't use animals and let me turn to hebrews hebrews 11 Let's, let, let's take a look at a couple of these verses. Hebrews 9, 22, I'm sorry. Hebrews, Hebrews 9, 22, let's read it, not me. It says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. We're talking about in the Old Testament, blood, yeah. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. We're talking about forgiveness, no forgiveness. There always had to be bloodshed. Okay, you had to an sacrifice an animal before you needed a priest to do it. You were your own priest. When God establishes priesthood, you had to come into the presence of the priest. Okay, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. You know, God had an elaborate system 
for all of his people. And God had a place prepared for them. They couldn't come to heaven. They couldn't go to heaven because their sins weren't forgiven yet. In the Old Testament, sins weren't forgiven. They were only covered, all right? Only the blood of Jesus saves. Only his blood. His blood was able to do what nothing else can do. Here's what the Bible says, okay? Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 now. I read verse 22 already. It says, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. It's talking about blood, okay? But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these, okay? No more animal. Animals was only able to forgive your sin, to purify your flesh for a minute, okay? Look at what it says, verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Boom, he didn't go into a temple to do it. He went into the presence of God to do it. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. The high priest did it every year. Okay, that's what it says, with the blood for others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, if you could lose your salvation. Okay, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Woo-wee! And as it is appointed unto men once to die and after this, the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time <laughs> without sin unto salvation. Listen to me, man. You know what that just said? That Jesus fixed it. Jesus finished it. We're not going back to any other system. You don't have to worry if God is going to zig and you're going to zag because you didn't get it. You know, he came unto his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him. Guess what? The gospel message is so transformative. It's so, so loving. It's so unbelievable that God would love us that much. But you know what? You believe it too. You know it's true. Okay. It just, it defies all logic. You know, you go to church and they tell you, oh, you got to keep the commandments. You got you to gotta do this. You got to do that. You know, you got to tithe. You got to do all of that. Okay. That's stuff for after you're saved. That's not something that part of your salvation. You won't, you can't help it after you get saved. Nobody trying to get you to do anything. Just hear the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do his work. Amen. He will prick your heart. Boom. Okay, before you know it, okay, you on your knees thanking God for saving you with tears in your eyes. How easy you could have missed this. All your friends and family have, most of them. Yeah, they've been churched, but that don't mean anything. It doesn't. You don't get any points for going to church or giving your money if you're not saved. Could you imagine somebody giving money to a church where they can't even get saved? That would be the worst nightmare, wouldn't it? Okay? But there are a lot of places where you don't hear the gospel preach. Now, let's finish this story. Okay? Now, do you understand what Jesus did? On that day, here's what happened. Here's what happened on that day. We're talking about, you choose to call it Easter. Okay? I don't like the word, but Resurrection Sunday. Okay, here's what happened. All right, now, several important, important things happened on that day. Early in the morning, he got there, and Mary Magdalene was very disturbed. And he stopped, and he said, Mary, and she said, Rabboni, and she tried to hug him. He said, touch me now, for I have not yet ascended to my father and your father, my God and your God, but go and tell the apostles or my disciples that I've risen from the dead. And she left with haste and she went. But Jesus said something then. It was early on Sunday morning. 
So he had some work to do. So he said, don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended. But, but what I want you to see is that when he came back that night, okay, so it was John 20 and 17 where he said, touch me not, okay? You have to understand what happened there. That was Mary Magdalene, okay? But then on the night, same night, we're talking in the morning, he had work to do. But that evening, the apostles were in a room, locked doors, and the two guys who were on the Emmaus Road had just come back, and they were telling them that they had just broken bread with Jesus. Okay? You say, who, 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 wait, wait a minute, this is Sunday afternoon before dark, okay? There were, he, he comforted Mary Magdalene, okay? And he said, don't touch me though. Just go and tell them I've risen. You, you, no need for you to be crying. It was clear he wasn't done with his work yet, okay? Just go and tell them. I'll see them later, all right? She went. They didn't believe her. How could they? Later that afternoon, right after lunch thereabout, two guys were headed to a small town called Emmaus, and they were kicking rocks, and they were very distraught, Okay? And Jesus walked up to him, and he started to walk with them. He said, what is this communication you guys are having? He said, you from around here, you haven't heard of Jesus of Nazareth? Three, they crucified him, and, 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 and they're telling the story. And, and he began to upbraid their faith, and he, he encouraged them a little bit. And when they were about to turn off to go to Emmaus, he made as though, the Bible says, he made as though he was going further. So all that tells you, the whole exercise was for them two guys. He made as though he was going further, and they invited him to the house. And he went to the house, and he broke bread with them. And immediately, they knew it was him, and he disappeared. Lord, have mercy. So what did they do? They ran back to Jerusalem. The trek home, they were kicking rocks and despondent and depressed on the run back to Jerusalem. Could you imagine? I mean, who won that race? We know when Peter and John was going to the sepulcher, I mean, John got there first, but he didn't go in. Peter ran right in. But picture these two guys. We just broke bread with Jesus. So they're gone now to the same place where the apostles are. So now they go into the room with the apostles and they're telling them, we just ate with Jesus, and they're saying, get out of here. We're not trying to hear that. We heard Mary earlier. We, yeah, blah, blah. I won't believe it until I see it. And boom, there was Jesus. And what did he say? He said, handle me and see. Spirits don't have flesh and bone as you see me have. He didn't say flesh and blood. He said flesh and bone. Okay? The blood was used for something else. Okay. The Bible says almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that these patterns, same pattern, had to be carried out in heaven. But heaven itself with better sacrifices than what they used to do it down here. Then it shifts it to Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figure of the true but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Okay. Nor should he offer himself often, as the high priest did. Okay. Please understand. So what happened was this. Jesus went to paradise, Abraham's bosom. They were all waiting down there for him. Okay, that's what David said. David, David loved him too. Okay. And he loved David. Okay. And I just want you to know, David said, you're not going to leave my soul in hell. Neither will he see corruption. Hallelujah. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. So guess what happened? All of the people. Now, in Matthew 27, check this out. Now, I started a little bit late. Check this out. In Matthew 27, verses 50 through 53, okay, read that now. And I bet you, you understand it. Matthew 27, 
Let's go there quickly. Get your Bible. Or oh, pause it. No, don't pause it. Just get your Bible. 27, 50 through 53. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 through 53. Important verses. You're going to see things here that you didn't see before. Matthew 27, 50. It says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. What does that say? He died. Okay? Preachers have colorful ways of saying it. Okay? You hear all kinds of stuff. You know, you know, you know, yeah, but he died. Okay? That's all that happened. He gave up the ghost. Please understand. You know what it means. Verse 51 says, And behold, when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. Boom. We talked about that. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. All right? Pay attention. All of this happened on crucifixion day. Okay? They needed more signs. So there was a violent earthquake. All right? That's what it says. The veil in the temple ripped in two. And there was a violent earthquake and the rocks broke up. Verse 52, and the graves were opened. All the way into verse 52. That happened on Friday. You have to understand into the middle of verse 52, right after the graves are opened. You can put a colon there if you choose to. It'll help you. Okay? Because it says the rest of what you read in 52 and 53 happened after the resurrection. So up until where it says, and the graves were opened, that happened on Friday with the earthquake. Why did he open the graves on Friday? Because they're coming out on Sunday. Everybody, talk about de dead man walking or dawn of the dead. Okay, but you know, not, de not that variety. These are all vegetarians. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. Okay, so look at it again. I'll read 51, 52, and 53 together now, and you will say, oh, okay. Jesus, verse 50, when he cried again with a loud voice, he died. You know when that's talking about, Friday afternoon. And behold, the veil of the temple ripped in two. That means that that Old Testament system is over, all right? And the earth did quake, and the rocks broke from the earthquake. Look at what it says. And the graves were opened. Boom. The graves were opened by the earthquake. You remember on Sunday morning, an angel came and rolled a stone away from Jesus' grave? We know he didn't need that to come out. But nevertheless, okay, these were physical people. Huh? The people who come out of the graves were just going to be physical people. It's not like you're going to have superhuman strength in your, you know. He opened the grave, just like they opened Jesus' grave. He didn't open his own grave. An angel came and rolled the stone away. That was his grave. But guess what? The earthquake opened their graves, everybody, all right? So now, on Sunday morning, when Jesus leaves paradise, all of the people in paradise get their glorified bodies. It's not just Jerusalem. It's talking about Jerusalem because that's where Jesus was. But if you were in Africa and you died there and you kept God's covenant, guess where you'd be raptured from? Wherever you were buried. You ain't got to go to Jerusalem to get raptured. We're not going to get raptured from Jerusalem. We're going to get raptured from wherever we are. Okay? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Okay? That's what's going to happen. It's called the rapture of the Christian church. Okay? And that's the next event on the calendar. Okay? It's almost as though you all don't want to hear anything else we got to say. So, see ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. You'd be better off being one of us, okay? Some glad morning when this life is over. Ah, come on now. I'll fly away. Amen. Yes. Amen. I'm out of here. It's all good for us. For us to live as Christ and to die is gain. It's an upgrade. And we don't care because everybody dies. 
when you get older, you get frightened because it's kind of like, wow, you're more vulnerable now and weaker and everything you should be. You had your peak and now guess what? <laughs> Getting ready to crash. Boom, happens to all of us. But guess what? Not a man that knows Christ. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? All of that happened on that one day. In the morning, he said, don't touch me. Okay, for I've not yet returned unto my father, but go and tell them that I've risen from the dead. Now, he takes all of those people that had died that was a part of God's program or covenant in a relationship. It's all about information. The ones who knew were saved. The ones who did not were not. That's why he told us we have a responsibility to tell everybody because if you don't share it, who, there's no guarantee that they're going to hear it. So you better share it in order for them to hear it. What is it that I'm supposed to share? You know what Romans 10 and 9 says, that if thou will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, confess your sin to the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay? Here is how the process works. Verse 10 says, for with the heart, man believeth you believe unto righteousness your faith is accounted to you for righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation okay that's it jesus died on the cross for you he was buried and on the third day he arose again from the dead he's alive our savior liveth okay Bible says he ever liveth to make intercessions for us. Do you believe Jesus arose from the dead? Do you know you should be saved if you believe that? But the devil also believes and trembles. He didn't stop being the devil. He's still the devil, but he believes too. So believing in it, you can believe all you want to and still be in your sin, okay? But here's what you have to do. Humble yourself in his presence. You go to Jesus in prayer. I'm going to lead you now, okay? I'm going to give you the gospel message. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. He loves us, all right? By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ. Okay? So what is it all about? You've got to believe that God loves you so much that he sent his son and his son gave his life. That's what he did. He gave his life. He didn't have to. Jesus didn't have to die. Jesus couldn't die. Okay? He could not die. What do you mean? Natural causes? No, he couldn't die of natural causes. Okay? The only way he could die is the way that he died. He couldn't die a natural death because death is a byproduct of sin and he was sinless. Okay? So he couldn't die. They had to kill him. And he allowed it to happen. My Lord. You know he allowed it to happen, don't you? Huh? What did he tell Pontius Pilate? He said, you have no power over me. I can call home and I can get 12 legions of angels, dude. That's what Jesus said. But he came because he loves us. And there was no other way for us to leave where we are to go where he is, all right? Except he did it for us. And now, them that wait for Jesus, well, unto us that wait for him, the Bible says he's going to appear the second time without sin unto salvation, okay? You accept Christ now. You don't go to paradise. Paradise is closed, okay? There's no exit sign anymore for paradise. They waited, and when Jesus came, he took them out when he left paradise on Sunday morning, and he took them home with him, okay? Wow. That's what the Bible says. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. That's bringing all of them out. And then he gave gifts unto men like you and I. So if you're willing to accept Christ right now, and you're not sure, just let's pray together. You believe Jesus is the Christ, don't you? Mm -hmm. That he died on the cross, that he was buried, he arose again. The whole Bible reveals him, okay? 
Let's go to him in prayer, okay? Repeat after me. Almighty God, my heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me and sending your son Jesus to die in my stead for my sin. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and I believe you died on that cross. I believe you were buried, and I believe you arose again from the dead bodily. And I'm confessing my sin to you, and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. Please, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for loving me so and revealing yourself unto me. Now, Lord, if you would just use me, I promise I will serve you forever. Thank you for loving me and thank you for blessing me. In Jesus' name, I ask these blessings, O oh God. And the people of God said, Amen. I love you guys. And I didn't get in any trouble tonight. Somebody got saved, I'm sure. Give your heart to the Lord. They have complicated and frustrated the grace of God. All right, they have done so by adding all of these things to it. I've heard some things, you gotta keep the Sabbath. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. Everybody got something you gotta do. God said, put your trust in his son. Okay. Take care, let's pray. Lord, thank you, breathe on us, cause us to see that the work in which we are engaged is the most important task ever granted to mankind. Lord, if we don't do it, it won't get done. Amen. You're not gonna use angels during this dispensation. You're using your children. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would loosen thou our lips. Give us the boldness that we might reach out and share your grace and your love with others around us. Lord, but we also realize that we might not be able to reach many of them because we don't walk our talk. So we pray that as we move things onto the slower track, O oh God, we will still try to reach them, but we pray that you would help us to love them and to teach them and to walk circumspectly before them. For no one wants to drink clean water out of a dirty glass. So Lord, we thank you for blessing us. And we know that you will save to the uttermost them that come unto God through you, Lord Jesus. So we're just grateful for all that you're doing and to think we have this simple message to share with the dying world. So Lord, we're just grateful. We say thank you. In Jesus' name we come. Amen. Good night, my friends. Next week we're going to get in some trouble. I just know it. I didn't want to do it tonight. I wanted to help somebody. See you soon. Thank you for listening to the Perfect Peace Broadcast Ministry Hour, Pastor Derek C. Noel, Perfect Peace Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. We are a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you please support us by whatever Holy Spirit places on your heart by visiting our website, perfectpeacebaptistchurch.org. Join us each Friday at 8 p.m. for our live broadcast by visiting our website, perfectpeacebaptistchurch.org or by subscribing to our YouTube channel or by liking our Facebook page. Thank you for listening. God bless.